Well, welcome and thank you for joining us for the service of worship at St. Matthew Lutheran Church in York, Pennsylvania. Whether you're on Facebook Live, on YouTube, or on the St. Matthew website, uh, stmat.org, we're glad that you are taking this time to join us for worship. As always, uh, this service includes the digital celebration of Holy Communion. Uh, it is entirely your choice whether you participate in that, but if you would like to, I encourage you now to prepare uh, with some wine and bread or grape juice. We will begin our worship together with the order for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes us righteous. Let us receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all our sins. Amen. God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace be with you all. Let us pray. Sovereign God, you have created us to live in loving community with one another. Form us for life that is faithful and steadfast, and teach us to trust like little children, that we may reflect the image of your Son 
Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This time we will now hear a children's message from Stephanie Johnson, our Discipleship Connector and Director of Children's Ministries. Hi there. Have you ever read 
The Mitten by Jan Brett. I love Jan Brett's books. She has the most beautiful illustrations. And the ones on the sides of the margins or the top and the bottom, they give clues about what might happen next in the story, if you're paying attention. You might want to check out her books sometime from the library. But anyway, The Mitten is a Ukrainian folktale, and the story goes like this. There's a little boy named Nikki, and he really wants to have a snow white pair of mittens. His grandma doesn't think that's a really good idea because if he loses them, they're going to be awfully hard to find in the white snow. But she goes ahead and knits him a pair, and he puts them on and he runs outside to play. And yep, sure enough, it's not long before he loses one of his mittens. And a mole comes crawling along, and because it's cold outside, the mole crawls right inside the mitten. And not long after that, a rabbit comes by, and when the mole sees the rabbit's big kickers, he decides to move over and make room for the rabbit. And there are all kinds of animals that, that come by. There's a mole, a rabbit, a hedgehog, an owl, a badger, a fox, a bear. And at the very end, there's a little mouse that comes crawling in and sits right on top of the bear's nose and makes the bear sneeze. And all of the animals get scattered all over the place. At the end, Nicky does end up finding his mitten, but when he brings it home, the one mitten that he didn't lose is the regular size, and the one that he did lose is huge and all stretched out, and his grandma's wondering what in the world happened to that mitten. Back when I was teaching preschool, we used to listen to a recording of this story, and it was fun because there was this refrain that would happen every now and then, and we would sing along. It went like this. There's always room for one more. There's always room for one more. So when the mole crawled in and then the rabbit came after that, we'd sing, There's always room for one more. There's always room for one more. And the hedgehog and the owl and the badger and the fox and the bear and the mouse there's always room for one more there's always room for one more that verse reminds me of today's gospel story jesus is surrounded by a lot of people as he often is and everybody wants to get close to him to talk to him to touch him to get a blessing from him and there are some parents there in the crowd too and they have their children with them and they want their children to kind of scoot forward and see Jesus. So they try to push them through the crowd. But when the disciples see that, they say to the parents, Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, Jesus is way too busy to deal with children today. You best just take your children back home. But Jesus overhears them and he says, No, 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 let the children come. God's kingdom is for them too. My love is for the children too. Let them come. There's room for them in my love. When you were baptized, that was God's way of saying to you, Hey, I'm really excited. You're in my family. There's room for you in my family. And I promise to always, always love you and be with you. There is always room for you in God's family. There's room for lots of people in God's family. Maybe you can find ways to spread God's love to other people and to let them know that God's love is for them too because there's always room for one more. There's always room for one more. Have fun spreading God's love this week. A reading from Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 and chapter 2, verses 5 through 12. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, 
having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world, about which we are speaking, to angels. But someone has testified somewhere, What are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory, Glory to, to you, Lord. Lord. Some Pharisees came, and to test Jesus, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch him touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to Lord you, Christ. Christ. The book of the Bible that we know as the letter to the Hebrews, from which we heard read just a few minutes ago, isn't really a letter at all. It ends like one, but it's not signed with anyone's name. And since it doesn't start like a letter with a, a salutation from the writer to the recipients, we don't have any idea at all, really, who wrote it. Now, for a long time, it was assumed to have been written by Paul, like several other letters in the New Testament. But a lot of Bible scholars who are all way smarter than me say that, no, it has similar themes, maybe even similar theology to Paul, 
but it doesn't read like one of Paul's letters. In fact, a lot of scholars consider Hebrews to be one of the most beautifully crafted works in the entire New Testament, much more lyrical than Paul's typical blunt and to the point kind of style. So the consensus is that Hebrews was written by one of Paul's closest students, someone who spent a lot of time with him and knew his teachings well. But who? Was it Barnabas? Luke? John Mark? Would you believe Priscilla? Yes, there is a strand of scholarship which identifies Hebrews' author as Priscilla, which would possibly make this the only book in the entire New Testament to be written by a woman, which unfortunately may be the very reason that the name was removed. In the male-dominated world of the first century, to have a woman's name attached to this document might have served to get it banned and buried before it could ever even be considered as part of the New Testament, as part of the Bible. Now, why is all of this important? Well, first off, because wouldn't it be awesome if it were true? (laughs) Second, because it provides context to the letter itself, to the way that we hear these words and the way that we imagine the original audience may have heard them. Because lastly, we live in a world which is not so very different from the world of this book. As the early Christian church expanded and grew to include people of different backgrounds and languages and cultures from from Jews living in Israel to Jews living in other parts of the world to non-Jews from all over the place, there was bound to be tension and conflict. There were factions, there was lobbying, there were populist movements and charismatic leaders and discrepancies in, in social and economic status. Does any of this sound familiar? So the early church had to learn how to define itself. It couldn't be as simple as a community founded around a single language or a narrow slice of society. It couldn't even be a common religious experience. So Paul and James and the writer of Hebrews, whomever they were, and eventually Mark and Luke and Matthew and John, or whomever they really were, they came to identify the church as the community which identified itself with Jesus. What Jesus taught, they sought to teach. What Jesus did, they sought to do. What Jesus was, they sought to become at least so far as humanly possible. But as we know, even that can be tricky. Take today's gospel reading, for example. How many of us have heard Jesus' words against divorce in his time as a combination of divorce in our time? Now, full disclosure, I have been divorced once myself. But that's not why I think that Jesus wasn't actually speaking against divorce as much as for the protection of vulnerable peoples, which in his day included divorced women. And as if to reinforce exactly how challenging it can be to follow Jesus' example, what do the disciples do in the very next breath but attempt to exclude another vulnerable population, this time children, from being welcomed by Jesus? Our Lower Susquehanna Synod the part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America that covers our portion of South Central PA, is giving all of their congregations a gift. It's a pretty simple gift. It's a yard sign. 
the kind that you see used by businesses and sports teams and political parties. It says on it, this is Christ's church. There is a place for you here. And it includes on it the name of the synod and its logo. Now, what do you think it would have meant for one of these ancient Jewish Christian congregations to put a sign like that in front of their place of meeting? What would it mean for St. Matthew Church to have one out along Market Street? Most churches pretty easily proclaim all are welcome here. But do we mean that? Really? Now, of course, we are not so crass as to say, you're only welcome here if you're of this particular race. You're only welcome here if you're of this particular political affiliation. You're only welcome if you drive a certain type of car, or earn a certain income, or live in a certain neighborhood, or don't live in a certain neighborhood. We would not come out and say something like that. But whether we intend it or not, we do proclaim limits to our welcome. This is how we worship, with this music, with singing here and silence here, with children giggling or crying or running here, but not here. You are welcome to come join us. Just don't expect us to change in order to make you welcome. This is Christ's church. There is a place for you here. Now this weekend I'm excited because we have the opportunity to hear how Meg Fulcomer Leonard feels called to join us in that work of welcoming and accompanying others as deacon for music, arts, and community engagement. See, I'm excited because I think St. Matthew can get behind that yard sign. And I think Hebrews would too. This is Christ's church. It is not perfect. And it does not profess to be. But it has heard God's perfect love beckoning us to come and be made whole beckoning us to come and proclaim that love to others who are just as equally broken and imperfect themselves. Hebrews challenges us to ask, are we thinking of Jesus enough? And are we thinking enough of Jesus? Are we thinking of Jesus enough means do we discipline our hearts and minds so that our actions reflect Jesus' grace and love for the world? And are we thinking enough of Jesus, meaning are we remembering that Jesus is present in every place and person and event, however good and praiseworthy and however shameful? and tragic. Jesus is there, and by his presence, Jesus makes every space holy. And the answer is likely no. <laughs> We're not thinking enough either way. But the church is a place for honesty and confession, a place of second chances and fresh starts. It's never too late.
the opening sentence of the book of Hebrews has made its way into the service of evening prayer in a way that has made its way into my heart. In that quiet ritual of of prayer and scripture and song, which gives thanks to God near the end of the day for nurturing all of creation and for accompanying us through that day, in the middle of the service, after the scriptures are read, there's no sermon, but there's a period of silence. And I find that silence at that time of day and at that place of worship very profound. And after a few moments, the silence is usually broken when uh, a leader announces, long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. And the congregation joins in, saying, but in these last days, God has spoken to us by a son. God has been a part of our lives, a part of our world from the very beginning. Always has been, always will be. God has no false perceptions of who we are. And yet God continually chooses to love us. And the most perfect example of that love is Jesus. Jesus, who gave of himself, who spoke out to protect the weak and vulnerable, who finds worth in every person he encounters, and who lovingly calls us to do the same. Amen.
let us join in confessing our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy God, throughout time, you have called your children to follow you and to be co-creators and caretakers of this world and its peoples. Bless your church that we may be a blessing to others. Restore broken places, communities, and relationships that all your creation may experience joy and wonder at what you have made. Strengthen relationships beyond or between nations and peoples that we would celebrate and support one human family. Bless all who live with any mental or physical disability and inspire creative spaces and environments that are accessible and hospitable. Give healing and hope to those in our midst, especially Pat Shu, Mary Blaisdell, Stephen Klein, Diane Billet, and Kathleen Waters. Bless members who can no longer travel to worship with us and remind us of their continued role in this community of faith. Fill the leaders of our world with humility and compassion, not fear and greed. Help us all to see our interconnectedness and interdependence with each other. Let us not become numb, apathetic, or immobilized. Instead, teach us to use the gifts you have given us to echo your cry. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. We pray for those peoples who have fled their homes or who fear to leave them. In Myanmar, near the Indian border. In Afghanistan, where the Taliban have refused to include women in the cabinet. In the United States, where refugees from Haiti and elsewhere have sought refuge but been turned away. Let us repent for all the ways we fail to see you in one another. May all who endure violence and trauma find the peace that only you can give. You promise eternal life to all your children. Thank you for those who have gone before us in the faith. Strengthen our trust in you. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Well, once again, welcome and thank you for joining us for this service of worship at St. Matthew Lutheran Church in York, PA. It's good to have you with us. Uh, we have an up, another upcoming opportunity for you to be with us uh, to celebrate and rejoice and dedicate our newly renovated auditorium. That is going to be on Saturday, October 16th at 5 p.m. 
Uh, we mailed out invitations uh, some weeks ago and posted them in various places as well, so you should have heard of this before now. The uh, deadline uh, has been graciously extended by our caterer until Friday, October 8th. So you still have the opportunity to RSVP to attend that reception and uh, program. If you would um, rather not attend the reception where people will be eating and drinking, but instead just come for the dedication program, you're welcome to um, register for that as well. Uh, that will begin at 6.15 p.m. that evening, October 16th. Please contact the church office to reserve your space now. The 52nd annual Crop Walk is coming up on Sunday, October 10th. Uh, you can walk when and where you choose. There's a display here in our gathering space with lots of information, and there's also that same information posted on our church's website, stmatt.org, including a link that you can click on to make a contribution. As I mentioned in uh, the sermon, we have an opportunity this Sunday in worship to hear from our own director of music, Margaret Fulkmer Leonard. Uh, Meg has completed her seminary degree and is seeking a full-time call as a deacon in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And as her gifts and passions align well with the mission and ministry of St. Matthew Church, the Congregation Council has recommended her to the congregation to consider for a new position, deacon for music, arts, and community engagement. And we have the opportunity to hear from Meg herself now. Thank you. It is my distinct honor to be put forward as your candidate for Deacon for Music, Arts, and Community Engagement. I thank you for this opportunity to briefly speak before you all today. As most, if not all of you know, I have had the pleasure and privilege to serve the people of St. Matthews as Director of Music for the past three and a half years. Music and specifically the music of the church has always been a first love and great passion. I thank God that I am able to share my gifts in this way. Several years ago, I followed the call to grow in my commitment to God and God's church, entering seminary and inter into deeper discernment of where God's call was leading me. The roster of word and service ministry has long spoken to me with its focus on caring for God's people, helping others live into their baptismal promises to advocate for, to love, and to serve God and neighbor, to bridge the gaps between church and world. This focus and these priorities are ones that I have seen in our congregation over my time here and throughout its history. St. Matthew and I share a passion not only for music, but for outreach and relationship with the broader community. In my time of discernment, which is just a fancy word for figuring things out, uh, listening to the Holy Spirit and judging what is the best course, so just a fancy word, I realized a desire to find creative ways to help people to engage more fully with their neighbors and their faith. I see growing potential for using my passions and gifts for music and the arts in broader ministry, both inside and outside of the church walls. Two weeks ago, St. Matthew Council's, Matthew's Council President, Bill Steele, beautifully stated how this congregation continues to prioritize and show passion for outreach and worship ministries. In the work of the St. Matthew Assistance Ministry, the Food Pantry, Bev's Blessing, the Youth Center, and others, there is clear and inspiring commitment to serve God's beloved children through community engagement. The many and various musical and artistic gifts of this congregation have been enriching worship life for many, many years. There is a commitment and love for these ministry areas at St. Matthew 
that align with my own sense of call. Let us pray. O oh God, may your Holy Spirit lead us and guide us today and all of our days as we all strive to best figure out how to heed your call to be your hands, feet, and voices in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. While St. Matthew's uh, church constitution does not permit us to have voting uh, during this digital service, voting will happen in each of our in-person services this weekend. The uh, results of that vote will be announced immediately following its completion after the 11 a.m. service Sunday morning, and we will announce that to the wider community as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible as well. But I do invite you to pray with me again now. Gracious and loving God, we certainly give you thanks for uh, your love for all of your children and for the shared role that you have given each of us as parts of your body in this world, for the vocations that you grant to each of us to live as your body. Uh, we thank you for the call that you have placed upon your daughter Margaret, and we thank you for the opportunity that St. Matthew has to discern this path forward with her. Grant us grace, grant us courage and strength and hope that together we may all see how to best serve you, your world, your people, and all of your creation. In your holy name, amen. We will now continue with a time of offering. Let us pray. God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Almighty and merciful God, you are most holy, 
and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. On the night of which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering therefore his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray in the words of Jesus, the crucified and risen one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All who hunger and thirst, come. The table is ready. Again, let us pray. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless us now and forever. Amen.
living word dwells in you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.